All right, cool. So we're here on the Bridge Podcast. I'm here with Bill Theris. Bill is a music theorist, uh, professor. Uh, he's an electrical engineering professor. And um, I wanted to just sort of get to the hard question first and just ask you uh, what you think of coffee. Do you drink coffee? Does it play a part in your life? We'll get into music theory later. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Actually, this is a cup of tea, but I, I do drink coffee, yes. Um, I'd love to hear about uh, as much as you're willing to share. Sure. Um, so, what, what? I mean, give me a little guidance here. What do you What do you want to talk about? <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of coffee, like how frequently you drink it, how how much you drink it. Oh, in terms, in terms if you have coffee. preferences like coffee, uh, black coffee, uh, coffee with milk. I usually make yeah. drip coffee in the morning. I have a, a, a lovely pot that of you know electric kettle. And you drip that through, and it drips down, and then you uh, drink it until it's gone. That's my strategy. Gotcha. Usually black. Excellent. Cool. Well, um, I guess that answers that. Uh, okay. You know, some people have more, uh, you know, sort of like indirect, long-winded things that give me a good window into their personality. But I yeah. see. Okay. Just I'm just direct. That's kind of a window. <laughs> Well, beautiful. Um, cool. Well, uh, I wanted to talk about ex exomusicology. I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, Zen harmonic stuff and everything. Um, sure. I'm curious, uh, first of all, just if you could give me a sort of lay of the land of what you think of modern music theory or like if there are various uh, sort of domains that you would cluster together. Um, uh, what's the landscape like right now to you? So, well, I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, in, in terms of music theory, you know, there's I guess the the part of it that I know best is what we might call the mathematical part of music theory. Um, so there's like a, a thing called the Journal of Mathematics and Music. There's another, the Journal of New, New Music Research. Um, there's a few of these places like this, and you know, there's a lot of lot of interesting stuff going on. People are people are exploring. You know, mathematics touches on music in a lot of different ways. And some of them kind of border on numerology and <laughs> just numerical oddities. And then some of them are, are trying to build sort of models of, of perception, for example, or models of the way compositions work. Um, you know, there's big themes. They, they might be something like, um, uh, so, so, so one theme might be analyzing harmonic motion. Another thing might be analyzing voice leading and you know, its relationship to harmonic motion. Yet another thing would be sort of rhythmic uh, phenomenon and how you represent them, how you distinguish them. How are two rhythms similar to each other or different? How do you quantify those similarities of differences? Um, and so there's a lot of stuff going on. I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a nice time to be sort of a, a technically oriented musical mm -hmm. person because um because you can examine things so one of the things that that you know in the past well it's it's quite a while now i'm gonna say past 20 years or so is you're able to take something like a, you have an idea of how something should work and now you can just fairly simply write computer programs or or use software to kind of investigate those questions and so i, I think this th th this goes a long way towards uh removing the kind of pure numerological things that are just mm -hmm. you know, numerical coincidences or well and there's also clever things you can do with numerology right um i'm reminded of you take the digits of pi right 3.141596 blah blah, blah 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 and now you turn those via some mapping into a sequence of notes you then uh sonify the notes by playing them in some kind of rhythmic pattern um i, th I think of that as an example of sort of numerical playing mm -hmm. um you know whereas there's also a whole group of people who are say looking at musical rhythms uh transforming them into mathematical representation and then defining functions that you know, measure similarity of difference between those various things and to some extent you you actually have uh you you're able to numericize what you kind of hear you know mm -hmm. uh, uh Something that's in straight four and something that's in a in a highly syncopated thing will sound quite different. They'll also have quite different measures when you put them into these these functions, and that allows you to do all sorts of things. You know, it's a little bit like um, 
is a little bit like at another level, you, you simulate sounds, right? And years, years ago, of course, you simulated sound very simply because your computer wasn't fast enough to do it in a, in a complex way. Um, and now as, as, as our computational resources increase, we're able to experiment more with things like timbre, you know, in, a, in, in fundamental ways that you couldn't do years ago or, or that were very laborious to do years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the, the guy that I actually heard about your work from um, is this guy, Andreas Gomez Emilson, and he, he's a real math guy, but um, I, the video he was doing was on the qualia of numerology, and he was sort of, you know, laughing at himself the whole time. Um, but, you know, an aspect of what he was getting at is like some combinations of numbers, you know, and like the whole idea of like an integer relation versus, you know, like an inharmonic relation. Uh, there's something like that's very beautiful about that. And he's sort of trying to carve out like what has the most resonant sort of beautiful sound. And I'm curious uh, if there's any sort of field in music theory that you feel like is orient oriented towards like what is the best sound, like almost like an ethics of sound, like what is the most enjoyable thing and should we be orienting towards that? So, uh, okay, uh, a bunch of work that I've done is sort of aimed at analogous questions to that. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit uh, naive maybe to imagine that, uh, to imagine that there exists a best sound mm -hmm. or, a, or a best pair of sounds or, a, I mean, I mean any, um, on the other hand, you, you, you you can sort of quantify or begin to begin to quantify certain aspects of, of sounds which impact the way the way you hear them. So for example, where does all this uh, simple integer ratio stuff come from? Well, where it comes from, or one of the one of the sources, is the structure of sound itself. So if you take a guitar string and you pluck it, it doesn't just vibrate once per unit length, it vibrates mm -hmm. at sort of, <laughs> I can't do, I need a, it vibrates in a sort of like up and down and up and down. But then it also vibrates in a mode that's sort of fixed in the middle and vibrates up, yeah, can't do it with my hands, up <laughs> and down and up. Okay, it vibrates in two pieces up and down like this. And it also vibrates in three pieces where the center goes up and the bottom ones go down. This is better with my fingers than with my little hands. And then in four and in five and in six and in seven. So the, the structure of, of a harmonic sound, that's just anything that's a um, driven by a single string or an air column um, will, will be of, of this type. And now if you think about, so, so, so what you have is a collection of overtones that's basically a fundamental, two times the fundamental, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. And so when you play one of those notes with it, itself sort of offset, meaning one of those collections of tones with a, with a similar collection at a different fundamental, then you can see that you, things will overlap in a certain, certain way. So for example, the simplest one to see is the octave. An octave is a factor of two. So if you think of one as being, say, a fundamental F, 2F, 3F, 4F, 5F, 6F, 7F, and then the octave of that is 2F, 4F, 6F, 8F, 10F, they're all the, and that's contained within the lower octave. Mm -hmm. So here's a way of, uh, uh, here's a way, you could simply say, count how many overlapping uh, overtones or partials existed in the in a pair of sounds, and that would give you some notion of how that is going to sound. Now that's a that's a little bit too naive to be particularly useful, but mm -hmm. it shows you the kinds of things that people tend to think about when they try to approach this question of the the qualia, the 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 the, the beautifulness. How do you you can't quantify beauty mm -hmm. literally? Um, but yet you can get at some aspects of perception. Gotcha. Okay. Um, is there any is sort of like uh, any, I mean, in all the different tuning systems and, uh, you know, different relationships that you've explored, is there anything that you feel like has particular oomph in the aesthetic department? So, <laughs> so one one of the things that, that, that I did early on is um, in playing around with the sort of internal structure of the sound. So, so essentially what, what, what some of the, the theories that we looked at in um, 
Tuning Timbre Spectrum Scale, which is my, my book. Of, with, one of the things we looked at in there was um, moving the overtones of the sound around and, it, and how that changes the sound. And so I mentioned that strings and, and air columns always tend to give you this harmonic relationship between the, the various overtones. It's nice numerical, simple, two, four, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, so there's nothing necessary about that. I mean, that's what happens with strings and air columns. But if you do other vibrating systems, you get different patterns of those overtones. So one of the things that, that's sort of beautiful about digital signal processing or digital audio processing is you can actually get into a sound and simply move the partials around numerically. You know, you can take that one that's not supposed to be at 2F and put it at 2.1F, just rewrite a computer program to do that. And so that gives you the freedom to kind of explore essentially all the possibilities. And now, as so often happens, now that you can explore all these things, you have to say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overwhelming amount of riches to explore. What should I actually look at? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, so, so you asked, are there, are there particular, so the ones I personally gravitated towards were the ones that are uh, normally considered to be difficult because those were the most challenging. So in other words, um, you know, playing in 12 tone equal temperament, the, the, the tuning that we all know and love from all the instruments that you're used to in an orchestra, mm -hmm. um, that's easy because many of its, many of its uh, the notes when you play them with each other, the musical fourth, musical fifth, the thirds, the sixths, um, have a lot of overlapping overtones and those give the sound, and at those intervals, a sort of pleasant, relatively beatless kind of thing. So this is, in perception research, they call it roughness. Mm. And it, you, you, can, you can measure the roughness of the sound in a fairly precise way. It's not exactly the same as what you would call musical dissonance, but it's fairly closely related. So um, sounds that are hard then would be, some, uh, or a scale that was hard, would be something like um, 10 tone equal temperament, mm -hmm. where if you're playing a, a normal harmonic sound, none of, none of the overtones overlap at all. They're just all willy nilly scattered around. And you end up with almost every pair of notes that you pick to play, um, you just get sort of a uniform dissonance. Mm -hmm. And so, so for me, one way of, of, you might think of it as, extending tonality, or you might think of it as uh, subverting tonality, depending on what your point of view is. But one way of playing with this is that if you get inside the sound now and move those overtones around, then you can fabricate systems in which the overtones will overlap in 10 tone equal temperament, sort of analogously to the way they overlap in normal 12 tone equal temperament. And that lets you do stuff like play really interesting chords or chord patterns in, in say, 10 tone equal temperament that mm -hmm. you can't really do. Um, and that you can't, well, of course you can always play them. You can always make those sounds, but what you, it allows you to do is control this, the amount of this roughness or thought of as a surrogate for dissonance. You can control that to go from fairly consonant to fairly dissonant. And that's, in my mind, that's, one of the ways that you go about creating pieces of music that, that are compelling and interesting because you have control over, I mean, the, the, the classic thing is you start out nice and consonant, you go on a journey through dissonance, and then you resolve back to consonants. Mm -hmm. Oversimplified, but it, it, it has a, it's, a, it's a story you can tell yourself about a piece of music. And so now you can do that in Tantone Temperament, whereas if you were using a regular guitar, simply refretted, to go into tantone equal temperament, you wouldn't be able to have that contrast between the highly dissonant stuff and the highly consonant stuff. Gotcha. Now, uh, I know that you have a guitar tuning book. Is guitar your acoustic instrument of choice or? Um, oh, well, okay. Hold on a sec. Here's, here's my wall. Beautiful. Okay. I don't know. So you see, okay, so then we, you can see there's the Stratocaster over there, the precision bass there. And I have, oh my, the guitar that's facing the wrong way actually has uh, 32 frets per octave. Oh, cool. Wow. Uh, 
uh, sorry, 31 frets per octave. A um, couple of regular guitars, a little ukulele bass, I don't know. Oh, so, some more. Uh, there's a, a Saz sitting up there, a little ukulele, and a thing called a banderia from South America. Uh, so yes, I tend to be a string player, if that's the if that was the question. And I guess the um, most of the sort of weird tuning composition that I do is done on a, um, is done by synthesizer because of course that's how you get in and manipulate this. It's you know it's, it's how you have to get in and manipulate the sound. And I've often done that on uh, various MIDI guitars. So I have a. Uh, an old one that's now sadly long out of production called the Beetle Quantar. Interesting. Um, <laughs> they've been out of business for a couple decades now. And I also have uh, a Star Labs controller, which is sort of less guitar like, but at least it still exists in the companies in business. So interesting. So um, I'd love to hear all about MIDI guitar, first of all. But um, before we get to that, uh, I'm yeah. curious if. Like, you know, for me, I'm also a guitarist. And when I started first learning like Maxim SP, I was essentially like seduced away from the guitar for multiple years. And I'm curious <laughs> if you were ever sort of seduced by the computational sort of Well, realm. okay, so so the latest thing I've gotten seduced by is over here. Oh, wow, cool. Um, so this is, uh, it, it was originally called the Terpstra. You know, it, 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 when it lights up, it goes through this opening routine to show you that it can go through all of its colors. Um, but basically what happens is you can you can program it and these are, this is just a MIDI controller. And once it um, once it settles down, um, I don't know whether this is for effect or if it's actually doing something, you know, like calibrating the keys. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, once it once it stops, then it basically each each key on here sends either a, a, a different channel or a different one. And so you have now instant access to uh, is it eight or 10 different uh, configure. I'm not sure what you can see through the, through the, uh, um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, my professional life is spent uh, doing a lot of things with computers. You know, I program in, in several different languages and Max is like one of my personal favorites. It's, it's like, you know, for, in the world of computing, right, Max is this tiny little blip that nobody <laughs> knows about. But yeah. in music, it has, a, it, it has a really important role in place because I think it, it eases the transition for lots of people, you know, who are guitarists like yourself. And then, as you say, seduces you into the sort of electronic mm -hmm. music world in a way that I mean, it, it, it's complicated and it, you know, it takes effort to learn Max. Nobody, nobody is born totally. and knowing how to program in Max. <laughs> and, uh, but, but at the same time, it's accessible to non-programmers, you know, people are non-professionals or something. I don't know what the right word is. Mm -hmm. Max is, is a programming language. You do program, it. but it's accessible to sort of regular people mm -hmm. in a way that many computer languages aren't. Just so, because it's graphical and not like text based. Because of the, it, you know, the, so these these kind of languages they're called signal flow languages because you have a well, you know, because there's a box and something comes out of the box and it goes through a, a wire and that goes to another box and each box has a defined function and then you connect them together with all the wires. So that's a signal flow language. There's a couple of others, by the way. There's one called LabVIEW that's plausibly popular in engineering. It's often used for like real-time instrumentation. You know, you have oscilloscopes or something and you wanna train them to do stuff they weren't originally meant for. Well, lab use your tool to, to, to do that with. Um, MATLAB has a thing called Simulink, which operates sort of fairly sim similar, similar, but there aren't very many languages like this. Um, so, so I do teach, I teach a class every once in a while in my engineering curriculum, which is about, about signal processing of sound. And I, I forced my class of 50 to learn Max. And what's really interesting is that many of them, you know, they humor me, right? I'm, I'm a fun enough lecturer and I give good grades. And so, so, you know, they like taking my class, but many of them are just gonna, you know, use Max. They 
get used to it for, for the semester and then they'll go away and never think of it again. But every once in a while, you get a person who like loves it. And, you know, they never would have encountered it otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and you've kind of converted someone to life, you know? This is the way I want to program because it's so clear and I can think about how the signals are moving around inside, you know, inside my computer and inside my algorithm mm -hmm. in a way that you really don't get when you, you know, type in, you know, type in text. Totally. Yeah. I feel like if you're doing the text, you sort of have to, yeah, I mean, at least for me, I need like a grand conception of what I'm going to implement before I even start. Um, That's so right. And, and, you, and you also don't have the real time ones. I mean, they, mm, true. not yeah. necessarily, I mean, actually there was a language called Super Collider, if you ever heard of Super Collider. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a textual language that operates in real time, like Max operates in real time. But that's rare mm -hmm. and it's tricky to do. And of course you can always spiral off into nothing. <laughs> Though Max can, you can easily end up with no Sorry. sound or simply noise coming out of Max, mm -hmm. you know, by accident. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in terms of MIDI guitar, um, I mean, I feel like back in the day, um, I'm not sure if you know the guitarist Brian had, not the one from Korn, but um, the guitarist from USC. Um, <laughs> but uh, he's a classical guitarist, but he's uh, he like was going to give me the rundown on MIDI guitars and we just never made it happen. But I'd love to get the rundown on it from you um, in terms of like any gear you'd suggest. Um, well, OK, so it, it's interesting. There's several different basic technologies that are now in use or have been in use through the years in terms of MIDI guitar. Um, the most basic and probably also the most popular uh, is basically you take a pickup, you put the pickup, you know, essentially close to the string, <laughs> and then you get a signal that's just the note coming out of that string. That's like a monophonic synthesizer. You essentially uh, do pitch identification and then that's now you send off what is effectively, I mean, it may not be a MIDI signal, but you know, something that is, contains the same kind of information that MIDI contains. And then that, that's what's sent off. And then you have essentially six parallel synthesizers or mm -hmm. up to six at any given time. Um, problems with that kind of technology are that you have to do the pitch conversion quickly, right? I mean, it has to be done. And the, the trouble with pitch conversion is, um, well, it, it, it tends to be uneven. Um, you can identify, think of a pure sine wave, right? You have a bunch of you know, air compressing and uncompressing and compressing and uncompressing. And it goes at a certain rate. High frequencies do it very fast. Low frequencies do it very slow. Um, it turns out that most pitch identification algorithms need a certain number of cycles before they can accurately report the, the sound. So that, so that high frequencies can be reported very quickly because they, you get a lot of cycles in a very short amount of time. Low frequencies, on the other hand, down you know, a low E or something might be 60 hertz. That's, if you have to wait three cycles, well, that's three times the 60 hertz. That's actually a fairly, from a guitarist's point of view, <laughs> 20 milliseconds is a fairly long time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you if you have an even delay of 20 milliseconds, you might be able to get used to it. But if it's an uneven delay, so that some notes are essentially instantaneous and others are delayed 20 milliseconds, it feels mm -hmm. like you're, I don't know, you're you're, you're playing in a, a, a vat of jelly or something. I mean, you can't, I, I, I'm not describing this very well, but it's very hard to, it's very hard to, to keep your timing accurate mm -hmm. when you don't get accurate feedback from the, from the air right. or, the, or the, the audio system that you're using. Um, so the pitch, the time to pitch, can, so, so people looked at that and they said, oh, well, hey, why don't we do something that's not pitch conversion? Well, what might that be? So Yamaha had a, a, uh, a MIDI guitar probably mid nineties. And it has six strings, obviously. And um, what, what they do is they bounce a uh, signal up the string. It hits your finger where your finger has fretted the string and then bounces back. Um, they then measure how long that takes. Interesting. And then they know where you've put your finger down. Once mm -hmm. they know where you've put your finger down, you just do a calculation and say, oh, well, that's this note. So that method 
Um, it's usually an ult ultrasonic little signal. So there's six little transducers down at the, at the bottom. They send a little pulse out. It comes back. They measure the amount of times so it comes back. Um, advantages of this system are that you uh, the delay is minuscule. I mean, because oh, the, the speed of sound in, in, a, in a string, in a piece of metal, is fast. It's faster than it is in the air. Mm -hmm. And so you, you essentially do that measurement perceptually instantaneously, although, of course, it takes some, some amount of time. Um, another advantage is when you bend the string, well, the string is a different length. Mm -hmm. So it knows that you're bending the string. Interesting. OK. Um, so nice feel. Um, still, you will end up with mistriggerings, right? So this is the bane of all MIDI guitars, is that they will, when they work, they work fine. Almost invariably, there'll be a certain percentage of the notes played that are essentially mistriggers. Either they trigger when you don't intend them to, they double trigger, or they fail to trigger when they should. Hmm. And Though, you know, if you're doing something that's not real time, like, you know, you're recording into a sequencer, not really a problem because you can go back and find all those missed triggers. They're all really tiny little notes now in you know, high piano roll notation. You have a nice, that's quarter, right? That's an eighth note. That's a 16th note. Mm -hmm. And that little thing there is a missed trigger because you don't play notes that quickly. Mm -hmm. So you can just, you know, edit them out. Unfortunately, if you're doing things live, for instance, those missed triggerings, well, basically what you do is you don't use sounds with a rapid attack. Because gotcha. of course, if the sound starts and ends before the attack actually ramps up, you don't hear it. So as long as you use pad-like sounds, um, you, you're golden. The mistriggering set kind of don't matter so much. Um, and then the third basic technology of MIDI guitars, might as well finish the story here while we're at it, is uh, what, what the star controllers do. And what, what they basically do is they replace the strings. Did you really need strings on your guitar? <laughs> they, they were played with six row, six columns, I guess, of buttons. And so essentially you have now a button field. All right, here's my button field. <laughs> and you can push them down. You can push them down. Um, so it doesn't really feel all that much like a guitar, mm -hmm. um, especially since they use the same width, same size buttons at the end and at the top. <laughs> You know, you as a guitarist, you know, you you just naturally expect the frets to be closer together when you're up here near your near your body than when you're down here and you're, you know, pushing fingers far apart. Well, forget that with the, the star controllers, they're the, they're the same with buttons all the way up and down. So it requires some uh, technique, some playing technique modifications. But on the other hand, uh, so those would that are the be any things. sorry would that be any different from like going from an electric guitar to like a nylon string like that level of uh sort of like oh this is a different instrument yeah i mean it's that kind of difference right i mean you know you you know if you if you sort of play enough stringed instruments they all kind of meld together you know not that one is mastered them all but maybe you're pretty good on one of them then you like passable on on the others kind of just automatically and I think this lets you leverage kind of the stuff you know, right? If you tune it like a regular guitar, then all your chord patterns work. If you tune mm -hmm. it like a regular guitar, then all your scale patterns, you know, so you, 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 you can transfer most or a large percentage of your kind of knowledge, certainly, and also a, a fair percentage of the technique can transfer. Although, of course, the further you get away from a real string making an actual sound, mm -hmm the less true that is. I mean, I I think with the star controller, you know, you have to spend hours before you start getting comfortable with it. Um, but I don't think you have to spend weeks. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, you know, yeah. It's it's different, but it's not I don't know, maybe it's more like the difference between a piano and an organ. <laughs> That one I'm less familiar with. Um, is uh -huh. this the same sort of technology that like is used on a like that synth axe monstrosity that Alan Holdsworth played? <laughs> like okay. the giant. <laughs> I, I you know I the synth axe. Okay, I 
never owned one, so, so that's why I didn't think about it. Um, I think the Cinex actually works slightly differently from any of the three that I mentioned. Okay. If I remember, and I hope I'm remembering the right instrument now, um, what they do is they also do this thing where they send a, a, basically send a signal down, but they've got it wired so that each fret, when you push the string down on a given fret, it completes a circuit. Okay. And so, so that it now, so that there's like going up the string into the fret and then sort of down a, something inside the, probably inside the neck that completes a circuit. So you know which frets is played based on um, the completion of this circuit. Gotcha, okay. So you're going to lack things like um, the pitch bend isn't gonna work on that kind of system. On the other hand, you're gonna have instantaneous and very reliable uh, note identification because you don't have to do pitch and so yeah, so it's, it's it's interesting that there's so many different ways people have thought of to try to turn the guitar into a synthesizer. It seems interesting that none of them have really, really gotten that much traction. Like, um, I feel like I've only heard of a few people, including yourself, that are interested in MIDI guitars, period. Uh, yeah, so. well, see, so the one of the reasons that I, I fell into the MIDI guitar trap, right? I mean, so I knew how to play, know how to play guitar much better than I knew how to play piano. You know, my piano skills are like, well, let's just say rudimentary. Mm -hmm. um, so I I wanted to have a guitar that I could play, and I wanted to be able to retune it the same way that I could retune my p you know my keyboard into you know ten tone equal temperament or whatever bizarre structure of tones that I wanted. So MIDI is great for that because you can take raw MIDI out of your keyboard, you can put it into a little Max patch that's not very hard to write and essentially turn any key into any pitch. Mm -hmm. um, so what I needed then was a, a guitar-like instrument that let me do that. So the pitch conversion ones, like this is like Roland's is probably the biggest seller of these things. And, and they have gotten a lot better by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't experienced the most recent iterations, but people tell me that the, the, the new ones are way superior to the early models make sense and they continue to sell them so I, well, I would hope so um but but that pitch conversion isn't going to help you play in 10 tone equal temperament without like refretting your guitar mm -hmm. so th that was that was no of no use to me so that's why i was exploring all these alternative technologies because they you know when you're bouncing a signal up ultra, through ultrasound inside the string and it comes back and it says oh it's that note it's not really that note it's just detected what fret you've pressed. And so now you can turn that again with a match, match open into whatever tuning you want to play. So on, on, on those two albums that you mentioned, Descent and Tonality and Exomusicology, the vast majority of the stuff that's played is played by a MIDI guitar. Gotcha. Um, not everything. I, I do have a, a wind controller. I used to play saxophone when I was a kid and I have a wind controller, a Yamaha WX6. In fact, it's sitting up here. WX5. Nice. Or EWE or mm -hmm. one of those things? Like an it's EWE. like one of those things here. I'll, I'll show you. Um, so it's, it, I mean, it, it, well, I guess it looks like a clarinet maybe if you, okay, so there it is. And you finger it, you finger it, you, you, you can sort of choose how you, if, finger, if fingers, you can choose it to finger like a clarinet, you can choose to finger like a, a saxophone, or you can choose it to finger, um, uh, basically, l like uh, like a recorder, but completely regular over seven octaves. So you basically the back instead of an octave key like you have, you've got like down two octaves, down one octave, regular up an octave, up two octaves, and then if you hit those, you get up three octaves. And so you can do seven octaves of stuff. Nice. But again, it's it's a MIDI controller, so the actual it makes no sound itself. It simply wants to. Uh, I mean, it simply plays whatever the synthesizer. And of course now everybody's using software synthesizers. So mm -hmm. all of my actual hardware synthesizers are relegated to the basement. <laughs> and, um, so some friends of mine have this guitar company that they're working on called Microtone Guitars. And their mm -hmm. idea is to basically have these magnetic fretboards that you can quickly remove. And so oh, you can cool. just start doing a different temperament immediately. 
And um, well, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm curious where your mind goes with that. And I'm somewhat trying to encourage some sort of collaboration on a hyper guitar. <laughs> so that would be great. I would love to have that to play with. Um, you know, how, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with the guitar, one of the things you want to do is you want to think of what what temperaments are people likely to want to play with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 12 tone equal tempers, obviously the, the standard, no, no doubt they're going to have a, a magnetic fretboard that works in that. Mm -hmm. um, you probably also want to do a couple of the other um, kind of standard equal temperament. So like 19 tone equal temperament is nice because it's sort of a, it's very close to 12 and it's very easy to play. Um, chord patterns that seem that sound very familiar yet also of course has well it's got seven extra notes in that octave and so you can also do stuff that you can't really do with 12 tone equal temperament um do you know neil haverstick mm -hmm. um, he's a guitarist from uh, boulder colorado and he's spent a lot of time practicing 19 tone equal uh, guitar uh, along with others and he's he's really a master of of, of that instrument Interesting. I'll have to um, check it out. I have the, I have this acoustic here with thirty one tone equal temperament. Nice. Which is here. I can show you. Um, didn't know I was going to do show and tell here. And of course, it's a little bit hard to see, but here here's the octave. And so if you count the frets, thirty one. Yeah. Between there and here. <laughs> the internet gods. Um, Sorry, so uh, the last thing you were doing was showing the octave and uh, the guitar. Oh, yeah, so there, if you counted, well, all I had the answer down, there were 31 different tones, mm -hmm. uh, different frets between high E and low E. Um, so that's kind of fun to play in. Uh, I mean, 31 has enough notes that you can get pretty close to anything you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you want to, if you want to play in sort of relatively just intonation-like stuff, um, you can get very close to those those sort of tonalities. Um, one of the things that's really, really fun about it is the, the, the different thirds that are available. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, you think of a major third, minor third, okay. In 19 tone, you also get a, a major third, minor third, and there's this neutral third that's kind of in between. It's quite nice sounding and gives you a, a well, a neutral-ish sounding chord that's neither major nor minor, but yet has all, all three notes. And in 31, you have even more thirds nice. <laughs> to play with. And they, you know, they, they're especially nice when you're like sliding between them and playing, you know, how you often can do this, well, you can, there's all sorts of gestures you can make when you have these extra notes that you can do a little bit more precisely than you can do maybe by bending the string. Mm -hmm. Although in some sense, that's one of the effects you can get. Though the other effect you can get, of course, is simply you know, chords that don't really exist in block tone equal temperament. Mm -hmm. do exist in these larger ones but back to your question about the magnetic strip magnetic mm -hmm. strip thing that sounds like a great idea if you can make it work and i would love to have one of those guitars so yeah um i know they... they'll, have a, they'll have a sale if they uh <laughs> can come up with a method that you know actually lets me swap out Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they've started on nylon strings, and I think next step is uh, steel string acoustic, and then eventually steel string electric. And mm -hmm. they seem to think that the steel string electric will be particularly juicy with all the overtones, like running through an amp and everything. So I, I'm excited to throw a delay pedal on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, of course, that's delay makes everything sound better. <laughs> um, if if you were to like sort of have say like three different necks or something that you were to commit to which what do you <laughs> think you would go for in terms of uh temperaments well so uh, okay questions okay mm -hmm. do the frets have to be so strong all the way across or um, can I think... they have sort of partially fretted things I think they can do fretlets or like, uh, you know, sort of like the Turkish style. Um, well, okay. So I happen to have a Turkish sauce. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, that, that's not exactly what I'm asking. So, I mean, what this is, right? So here, here's, here's a sauce, right? And it's, it's sort of, it's got, um, 
sort of a non-equal non-equal tone thing here. There's seven, 17 uh, stops in, in the octave and you see they're not equally spaced. It's not 17 tone equal temperament, it's its own thing. Um, but these are these are done by, um, notice how they go straight across, right? Can you, uh, look I was wondering, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> it goes straight across like the frets on the guitar go straight across. So that means e each string that you fret you you know you have to do at those locations mm -hmm. with with a magnetic thing that I'm thinking of and I, I don't know exactly how they're doing this. I'm I'm sort of asking, could you have it be say here on this string and then move down to here on this string and then back up to here on this string, so that when you finger it, you get uh, why should every why should every string have the fret at the same location? Right. Interesting. So, so, are you thinking? So, like so, the, so the question I have is: Can can is this general enough to be to allow me to sculpt a, a, a tuning for my thing, sort of in conjunction with the way I'm going to tune the strings? Because that, of course, is a, is a they need not be E A G D B A, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that would affect my answer on what. What I want. So, so what I what I would be I would be particularly interested. I mean, I'm interested even if they have even if I have to use just regular straight across frets. But um, I would be particularly interested if you didn't have that constraint mm -hmm. and you could sort of make the frets, you know, be bendy or, or not um, not a, not. I mean, I suppose one thing is you could do is put it at an angle to the to the fret board. Mm -hmm. But even more, I mean, what if you wanted a V shape to the or or, Interesting. or other sh such shapes? I've never even thought about that as something. Uh, Be because you see, you see, the reason I ask that is because you want to be able to, if possible, you mm -hmm. want to be able to choose essentially choose whatever pitch you want out of each note. But but the strings that interacts with how the strings are tuned. Mm -hmm. So if the strings are tuned differently, then of course you're going to have you're going to potentially want different relationships up and down the fretboard. Mm -hmm. um, so they ask your friends if they have <laughs> thought of this, and it, maybe they have, because it's not, I mean, I didn't make the idea up. I've seen, um, who was it? I can't remember. I've seen a guitar in the past with, with, a, a, a bunch of non non consecutive frets, um, and I I think it was done to 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 achieve a, a certain collection of just intonation uh, intervals on the guitar to make it easy to play those just intonation uh, hmm. intervals. Um, though I'd have to look up exactly how it was done. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, I'll definitely inquire if they can do that. Let's just assume that they can do whatever uh, yeah, is in yeah, your. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think I think you'd want to think about what exactly you want. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I hadn't given it a whole lot of thought before because I didn't know the technology existed to make it real. So, but I'm sure there's some interesting things you could do. Gotcha. Um, and, and those would lead to sort of interesting sounding. Uh, you know, tonal palettes from which you could structure songs or mm -hmm. whatever you want to make out of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned like a hyper guitar in this case, and I, I say that because obviously you've done this hyper piano. Um, I'm curious if you're familiar with Denman Maroney. Mm. He's a he's another hyper pianist, um, oh, okay. Okay. but uh, it, very much a different type of hyper piano. Um, for him, it's like he puts some, you know, doodads in there. It's more of like a John Cage sort of prepared thing. Um, oh, okay. Excellent pianist, though. Um, and so it's interesting to hear about these two different hyper pianos. And um, I'm curious about this, like, notion of the hyper instrument and what it means to you, how you came to that so, term. Okay, so, yeah, that wasn't actually my preferred term um, <laughs> for, for, for the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I did that work in, in, in conjunction with a guy named Kevin Hobby. And we started out talking um, sort of in, in just informally, you know, just bandying stuff about. And at one point, he asked about, you know, why, why are strings always harmonic? Okay. 
And I said, well, okay, you know, I mean, that's just the, the, the that's the, the model for an ideal string, one which has uniform mass to tell you know, rigid on, on the two sides. Um, so if you vary, say, the mass of the string or the, den or the density of the materials or something like this, then you'll end up with the string will produce inharmonic uh, sets of overtones. Um, so then the question is, uh, you know, I mean, I, we've known this for a long time. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost like, you know, it, it, this is why they make guitar strings. This is why they go through so much effort to make guitar strings have very, you know, be uniform, mm -hmm. right? And so I'd always sort of wanted to try stuff with, um, you know, make, with non-uniform strings. But the problem is, is how do you even begin experimenting with it, right? Like how, mm -hmm. what, okay, so uniform is nice because it's a single thing, right? When you say non-uniform, well, there are a thousand ways it could be non-uniform. How are you gonna pick amongst them? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was going through this with Kevin and saying, yeah, you know, but the problem is I don't know how to manufacture anything. <laughs> Let's suppose I could design you know, I mean, I knew, I, I knew there was mathematics out there that would describe, given the contour of a string, given how the density changes or how the mass changes, um, it would describe how the overtones change in response to those co mass contours or density contours. I knew that there was mathematics out there to do that. Um, but I didn't have any way to manufacture the string. Like, suppose I designed a great string that, you know, started out and came down like a you know, triangular and then flattened out for a while and then went, okay, now what? How do I build it? And so I was sort of complaining about that. And Kevin, who's, who's, who's very clever uh, m mechanically as well as musically, um, he said, well, well, okay, you know how they make piano strings, guitar strings, there's like a central core and then there's a winding around the outside, right? He said, well, what if we just like got one of those and unwound it a little bit and then you'd have like a thick one and a thin one. And it's sort of like, duh, right? Okay, <laughs> I mean, real, a, a beautiful solution to the problem. So now not only do you have a way to manufacture these things, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have a set of constraints, right? So the constraint is, well, you can only wrap and unwrap a couple of times. <laughs> you know, you could, you, you could conceivably unwrap from the center and have a thick, thin, thick, or you could mm -hmm. wrap from one side you have a thin thick or a thick thin, but but you can't have you know triangular things going into conical things going into you know those just aren't going to be feasible. So it reduced the, the 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 search space over which we had to look in order to find stuff. So so what I did was I wrote a some, some computer programs to simulate these different sounds. So in other words, you had like a slider that said, okay, the first segment is this thick. The second slider is this thick, the third slider is this thick, and here's how long they are. So there was like four or five sliders. And you pressed a button and then it gave you a simulation of what it, string, such a string ought to sound like or would approximate. You know, yeah. It was a crude form of additive synthesis, basically. So you got an idea of what it might sound like. And so I gave those to Kevin and, and he played with them endlessly and finally decided there was one that he really liked. And so that's the one we built. And uh, was there any sort of criteria or it was just like a gut reaction to this is the one that so, I like or? So the, the, the reason, why did he really like it? Or is okay. the dissonance curves thing? Yeah, so, okay. so the reason he really liked it is because it had a, a really nice property that it sort of mimicked. Okay, so uh, a regular strain has a sort of, when you play it in, uh, along with itself or with another string of the same kind. Um, essentially, when you play them at unison, you essentially have the same thing. That's totally consonant. When you're just a little bit off, you kind of rapidly increase in sort of the dissonance. You get to about a half step or whole step, and you, you know, you've got a lot of dissonance between them. And then it does this sort of thing where it kind of bounces around. So the interesting, so over the course of an octave, you'll have consonant points at the fourth and the fifth, you know, at the sixth, a less, slightly less constant at the sixth and the third. And, you know, those per musically points that you would musically expect to have relative consonants. So this particular uh, structure 
that Kevin chose. What it did was it had the same general shape as the 12 tone equal tempered one, but stretched out over two octaves instead of one. Interesting. Okay. So that was the that was the thing that appealed to him. And so that's the one we built because he expressed a definite preference for it. <laughs> gotcha. And so you know, why why he liked that one over some of the others, I don't know. I mean, I, I could have gone any number of ways. Um, but but that but you know, because well, frankly, Kevin did most of the work. <laughs> so okay. since he was gonna do most of the work, we needed to pick something that he was highly motivated to do. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I did the math, right? I did the, in one sense, you know, I went to the literature, I found the, the correct equations, I applied them, I wrote the computer simulation to, to, to do that. So that was a bit of work, but um, nothing compared to, you know, he basically bought this baby grand on eBay for $150 or whatever it was. He brought it home, he stripped the innards out, he then made all the strings that were necessary to, to do this thing. He rejiggered the, the piano key mechanisms so that they'd strike uh, correctly and essentially rebuilt the whole piano. And so I'm, there's a massive amount of- <laughs> Yeah, sounds like it. Um, if you were to translate this to guitar, um, I'm imagining that, you know, like having an inharmonic string on a guitar would be kind of strange. Um, and so does this not, like, would this not really work at all or is there, some sort of tricky okay. workaround. Really, really, really good question. <laughs> and the answer is, I wish I knew exactly how to do it. <laughs> so here's what I mean. It feels to me like there's got to be pa patterns of non-uniformity okay. in the string, which will interact nicely with the mechanism that you're used to playing. So imagine, I mean, imagine a simplified guitar with just two strings, okay? Yes. And imagine that we're gonna have one be a drone, so we're not gonna even fret that one. And now we're going to fret the other one. So what's interesting about the inharmonic string on the fretboard is that each time you press down at a different fret, you, of course you get a different note, you write a different fundamental, just as you normally would on a guitar. But also the proportion of, let, let's say your string was like one of these fat, thin ones, right? Mm -hmm. So the proportion of fat, thin to thin string changes each right. time you fret. That changes the timbre, the, the structure of the overtones as you change the note. So you, so, so in essence, you have a whole, I mean, you have a whole extra level of complexity mm -hmm. in the fretted instrument over the harp-like instrument or piano-like instrument. Because in, in, in the piano instrument, each note is the length it is and sounds the way it does based on how, you know, how you've calculated the thing. But now what you have to do is there's an interaction between the place you place the frets, where you place the frets, and the timbre that's going to come out, as well, of course, as the fundamental that goes along with that timbre. So I I'm sure, well, I'll bet, I would like to believe that there are ways of contouring the string in concert with fretting the fretboard that would allow you to have very interesting sounding stuff going on. Gotcha. Um, okay. However, I have not done it and I don't know the answer really exactly. This is um, something that, I mean, it, it, you know how you have a, a, a bucket list of things you need to do before you die. <laughs> okay, well, I think Get designing an, in, an inharmonic guitar like that is one of those things that I, I would like to do. We'll have to stay tuned on uh, your progress with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I, I I'm not actively working on it right now. So if I don't know if anybody watches this thing, um, and you feel like you would like to work on this problem, I know how to do the mathematics, but I don't know how to solve the problem yeah. so, <laughs> okay, you okay. i'm talking to you um yeah cool so you're right i mean i'm, I'm sure there's just so many degrees of freedom that you have and then there's a lot of constraints mm -hmm. so it's a matter of sort of deciding what you want and then finding how close you can get to that thing you want 
Um, while uh, you know we're, I guess, getting here up at an hour, so I just want to wrap I'm up with. A lot, yeah. Was that? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so with this idea of exomusicology um, and sort of like you know some sort of speculative music theory about aliens, um, I, I'm sort of curious what your uh, non-musical intellectual interests besides electrical <laughs> engineering are. Um, or, or sort of like cultural interests, um, if there's anything that, uh, you know, you're interested in that realm? Well, you know, the, the, the problem isn't finding something to be interested in. <laughs> the problem is finding the time to explore all the cool things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess, I mean, you know, musically, I've been playing around with a bunch of um, kind of basically algorithmic composition type things recently, mainly centering, centered around, um, uh, uh, okay, one way of envisioning rhythm is as a, a, a circle. So each time around the circle is one, well, one phrase or one measure or one unit of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, various cultures actually notate things this way. I mean, the, the Indian Tala or this old timeline thing from, from Africa. So now imagine that you have, so points, along the circle now mark places where you're going to hit and, and make a have a musical event occur so mm -hmm. if you think about it, if you join together these things they form polygons so you're doing the straight lines you have a little polygon so if, if it was four exactly things happening in the circle that would be a very boring rhythm you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. then it would be square and it can be five six seven and of course they don't need to be regular at all mm -hmm. so that's the framework there's a bunch of different measures that you have which um, help define interesting sounding rhythms. So I was, refer I was alluding to this a little bit in the very in in introduction. Um, what, what, for example, one of these is called perfectly balanced. Okay. Um, so, uh, something that was uh, in invented by a guy named Andy Milne in West, West Sydney University. And what, 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 what perfectly balanced is, imagine you take that polygon that we just talked about and you sort of cut it out of cardboard and you find its center of gravity, right? So you balance it. If it balances at exactly the center of the circle, that's called a perfectly balanced. Rhythm. Interesting, okay. So obviously, well, obviously if you think about it, any regular polygon, a square, a hexagon, a, you know, a tengon, whatever, mm -hmm. are perfectly balanced because they're completely symmetric. But interestingly, there are a bunch of non-symmetric uh, shapes, which are also perfectly balanced. And many of them are very interesting to listen to. So when you sort of sonify this stuff, you get very interesting patterns of sound. And so there's one of my recent obsessions. I'm curious if you've ever uh, messed around with the uh, OEIS, like the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Uh, they have like a midi generating function on that do they okay that's it, it's it's too much fun for me to you know uh... listen to euler's totient and <laughs> uh, listen to the digits of pi I, I i have not done that um it's it's great fun the the thing that sort of i guess like bothers me is that inevitably you have to put a modulus on it and like it's always sort of in the pitch realm but um i don't know i, I guess like i wish that there was a better way to sonify these sequences without you know it just being like and you know, getting well, out of range, or I mean, I, I, there are a lot of ways of sonifying things. So many years ago, do, do you remember what when fractals were a big thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, everybody was drawing these cool pictures of the Mandelbrot set and all these interesting things. So, so one of the things, of course, that you think of is, oh, well, why don't we generate music doing this? And I, I did that. I mean, there's a bunch. If you go to my website, there's a whole little section on fractal music, and you can hear the kinds of things that that I came up with. Um, and so basically, in order to handle some of this stuff that you're talking about, you don't need to consider each um, each number that comes out of this fractal generator. It's basically an iteration, and it's generating all these integers. So, um, well, they don't need to be integers, of course, it can be whatever, but it's generating all these numbers. And then you can, you can take these numbers, and of course, you can sonify them as pitch, but you can also say, take them in pairs and sonify them as pitch and duration. Okay. Or you can do more interesting stuff. You know, you can do pitch, duration, and velocity, right? You mean just imitating MIDI, right? Or you can, um, and then you then you start to use more of these. So you you, you then move along the sequence 
uh, in triplets or quadruplets or whatever you whatever mapping you've chosen, and you can make them sound quite interesting. You know, you can even have you know every fifth one be a patch change, right? So it changes. Well, you know, and you can mm. do fifty different pianos, so that you get you're not every every piano note that's a C note doesn't come out the same because mm. it gets stale very quickly. You know, whereas if you rotate the patches of the pianos and rotate the notes and rotate the, then then it ha it helps to maintain a kind of richness. Um, and I do, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person who did this kind of thing, but at the end of the day, you can get some really cool sounding stuff. You know, it can. It, it, but here's here's the rub. So I, I was very happy with myself for a long time, and I was like, oh, cool. I'm you know I've got the Sierpinski triangle. I've sonified it. It's it's sounds as cool as it looks. You know, and then you pause and you think, hmm, what if I just took like you know some other sequence, you know, like digits of pi or something, and put that into my map? What would happen? What well, turns out, it also sounds cool, and in exactly the same kind of way that the fractal sequence mm -hmm. sounded cool. In other words, what I was listening to, or the composition that, that was accruing had very little to do with the specifics of the numbers that you put in and very much to do with the mapping that you chose to use gotcha. from those numbers into the sonification. And so my suggestion would be going to these numerical sequences. Um, I'll bet you can get them to sound really cool, but I bet you won't be able to list, take whatever sequence you started with Euler's totient function, if you then apply the digits of pi to that exact same sonification method, you won't be able to tell the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really listening to there is not the numerical sequence. You're listening to my mapping mm -hmm. from numbers into sound. And because there's lots of interesting mappings from numbers into sound, you can make it sound like lots of cool stuff. And I assume that if you just used some sort of like noise, it would be a similar thing. Like it depends yeah, just, on the mapping. Yeah, just do random numbers. It doesn't matter. I mean, the mm -hmm. digits of pi are pretty darn random. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you I, there's a paper that discusses. You know, there's tests for randomness, right? That you can do on a on a on a on a number. And pi passes almost every test of randomness, <laughs> even though, of course, it's not random at all, right? I mean, it's completely determined all the way out to infinityth decimal place. So at least in the short term, it's very random appearing. Who knows what happens down, you know, mm -hmm. af after the trillionth digit, who knows, but certainly the first few billion are <laughs> indistinguishable from random mm -hmm. from the point of view of it, from the statistical point of view. Gotcha. Um, cool. Well, I guess um... <laughs> I'm not sure. I've talked your ear off, haven't I? No, I, I mean, I'd love to keep on asking things, but I'm not sure what else I have. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, I guess just real quick, I'll sort of ask for any sort of guidance that you might offer somebody considering, you know, music grad school um, in this sort of weird realm of like technical stuff where it's like, you know, I'll, I'll never be good enough to be a true math, you know, grad student, but like I'm... Like I, I realize that most most musicians doing math is kind of it's cute, you know. Um, so like I'm well, interested in math, but like uh, I'm not I'm not at that level to like really do it. So um, for somebody like that who's doing music, okay. So so for given that what you said, I'll give you advice. Okay. Okay. If you want to pursue this kind of thing, what I would do is team up with someone whose expertise was math and maybe was just kind of interested in music but didn't have musical skills. Okay. Um, I think. By collect, it, 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 the process of collaboration is normal all throughout science, and it is the way that you go into a new field. Um, you know, I mean, you might start out being the sort of junior mathematical partner in this, and three papers later, you might be the lead. That's actually um, that's great advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I think collaboration is 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 really important. I mean, collaboration is is so useful because people have complementary skills, mm -hmm. and you know, that's worth. I mean, I mean, I never could have built the hyper piano that Kevin built. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe in principle I could build it, 
But in reality, my apartment's too small to have a <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, what am I going to do? Like, buy a house so that I can try to build a piano in it? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, just as, as a pure practical matter, I, I, I could never have done that. And, you know, and I would I, probably, it's true that Kevin wouldn't have been able to do that without me as well. So, so it's, 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 it's by collaboration. Um, in general, I mean, if you're, you know, take your dreams and pursue them. If it means going to grad school in math or it means going to grad school in music or it means whatever, mm -hmm. then that's what you should try to do. I mean, maybe you'll fail, but if you don't try, then mm -hmm. you definitely will fail. Are there any sort of like big areas that you feel like are particularly juicy in music theory or um, like music technology that uh, you wish that people would attack? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, lots of people are interested in this kind of stuff. And well, I mean, lots of people. I mean, there's a passionate subset of humanity. <laughs> very <laughs> tiny subset. Okay, who 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 are who are interested in this in this kind of stuff? And I mean, I think I mean it's you know it's like in, in the from the techno technology side, right? Okay, I mean I'm, I'm an electrical engineer by you know, my my degrees in in electrical engineering, and engineering is very sort of fad driven. You know, we everybody thinks, oh, adaptive systems are really cool. And then five years later, oh, adaptive systems are boring. The, uh, the fractals are really cool. And then, and, well, fractals are really boring. Wavelets are really cool. And and right now, there's sort of like a lot of hype about uh, deep deep networks, deep learning networks. And so this is like where the frontier is right now. People mm -hmm. are applying them to solve problems that have been elusive in the past. You know things like you want to automatically determine the key that a piece is in. Okay, you want to uh, extract the melody line from a piece of music. Now, of course, you as a as a trained musician can listen to a piece of music and extract the melody line with a pencil, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you get a computer to do that? Right. That that is actually probably right now becoming within the state of the art. That's that's an, that would be an example of a problem that you know, you could feel good about attacking because it's not fully solved, but also uh, it's not so, it's not so impossible that you would never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in one sense, the advice there would be, look at what the fads are, put yourself at the forefront of one of those fads and be one of the first people to apply that fad to your chosen favorite subject, whether it's mm -hmm. rhythmic patterns or melodic patterns scalar patterns or pitch patterns or models of the way you perceive stuff models of the way your ears work whatever it is that you're you know sort of is your area of interest find that the, the the technology will somehow be manipulatable into that form and then that's a good project okay um so one of the projects i'm working on right now is essentially like an algorithmic death metal project where I'm trying to generate like novel forms. Um, and I'm curious, so like, you know, I don't know that I would do research in this realm. And so it's like, you know, is going to grad school in something like this, like a composition type thing like this, like there isn't really research, like I'm not, I wouldn't be contributing science necessarily, but like, is there so, so anything? In, yeah, so in music, right? I mean, you have a composition major, right? And, you know, that's not research like, scientific research is mm -hmm. research. but it but it's often you know people doing composition or exploring for instance in algorithmic composition you're exploring how to apply different kinds of mathematics to the problem at hand which is generating uh, your death metal uh sequences i don't know what <laughs> i mean are you actually son making the sound or are you generating a midi file that looks like the sound or are you no it's so basically whatever, it's all midi stuff yeah okay so so it's, it's midi so that makes it easier in a way right mm -hmm. because midi um you know is a subset of what we can you know it's easy to manipulate and it's a subset of what can be 
you know, sonified, what, what, what can turn into sound. Um, I mean, so what are the rules? Okay, I know nothing about death metal. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, you know, I, I'm a little too old for that. Um, but I would ask you, okay, what are the basic, what defines a piece to be in this style as opposed to some other style? Mm -hmm. If you can answer that question, then can you answer the question, here's two compositions, which one is in the death metal style and which one is in the opposite style? It's a classic. It's a way of stating something as a classification problem, mm, right? Okay. Um, once you state something as a classification problem or or an optimization problem, um, you can then start to automate things. Now I search and I find all the MIDI files on the web. Which percent? Which, which subset of them are death metal MIDI files as mm. opposed to what non death metal MIDI? It's okay, they keep it simple. Um, I don't know. I mean that certainly could lead to interesting compositions mm -hmm. where you then took that subset of death metal files that you were able to extract from the web and combined them in some way into some kind of composition. Interesting. So uh, I guess the research is almost like extracting some sort of awareness of what the, like the defining genre characteristics are. For example, that would be a kind of question. That you okay. ask. So someone who's good at this and might might be worth talking to if this interests you would be Dmitry Tomasko at Princeton. Okay. You know him? He wrote a great book called um, something like The Geometry of Music. And in The Geometry of Music, he's, he's got some theories about how things work, but he's got um, also some very nice al algorithmic um, analysis methods. So he can look at sort of chord patterns as used in uh, in popular songs and then he plots them on this sort of hypersurface and then he can learn stuff about sort of what makes them tick by the paths that they follow on this on the sur surface interesting okay so he might be somebody you want to interview actually. yeah definitely that's that's a great suggestion um okay cool he's, he's also charming so <laughs> um Okay, I'll, I'll look him up. That sounds great. Um, I'm trying to think of if there's anything else in this uh, realm. Well, I guess, um, is there anything else you want to like end with before we wrap up? Uh, do you want to... Well, you know... thanks for having me here to chat about whatever. I mean, That's my pleasure. Thanks for I, joining I hadn't me. Really, I didn't really have much of an idea what you were going to ask me about. <laughs> like, didn't prepare anything. But, you know, like a good professor, I'm always willing to talk about stuff that I only barely know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I think in the greater scheme, I wanted to, like, have, like, a, you know, a deep dive on something. But I feel like uh, sort of going around a bunch of different things and just geeking out was, you know, maybe the better bet. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if, if you want to do a deep dive, we can, but maybe we should prepare. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll share some of the stuff that I'm doing, uh, like some of the spreadsheets and all that uh, okay, for this sure, metal project. <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. see what you think. Um, but uh, your website is, I mean, if you look up Bill Sotheris, it's there somewhere on uh, Google. <laughs> somewhere. You can certainly Google me. Um, uh, I mean, most mostly, I mean, I have a lot of stuff on my university's website because, you know, it's, so I, I, I was one of the first persons that I knew to make a website <laughs> and I did it on the university site. And so it's actually sort of like coded in HTML. So I have a classic look to my website. <laughs> Which I can appreciate. Yeah. I mean, I just never got around to, I mean, by the time, you know, for, there were a whole bunch of generations of different kind of software that let you write nice looking websites. And, and each time, by the time I got around to thinking, oh, maybe I ought to do that, they changed it and mm -hmm. something else. And I mean, maybe things are actually sort of stabilizing on WordPress or something. And I should redo it that way, but. Yeah. I mean, it, your website has a bunch of interesting stuff on it. And I definitely, uh, you know, I, was, Just, you I know. heard about you from this guy and then I scoped out your website. And I was like, Bleh. Um, I, I didn't even know about the hyper piano stuff. I just knew about the exomusicology stuff at first and then um, learned everything else. But Well, I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of interesting stuff on my website. That's why I put it up. Cool. All right. Well, um, 
I guess uh, we'll close this out then. Uh, Bill Satheris, thanks so much for joining me. Maybe we'll do this again in the future. Um, and I'll hook you up with these microtone uh, guitar guys. Yes, I'd be very interested in what they're actually doing and how successful they are at making the, the swappable fretboards. That's mm -hmm. cool. Cool. Well, um, all right. Thanks for joining me. I'll talk to you in the future. Okay. Adios. Bye. -bye.